Sure. All right. We'll get started then. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you all for being here. Hope you learned something today. Uh, so I'm Ola. I am a PhD student in the Data to AI Lab here at MIT. So my lab does a lot of this like data-centric AI stuff you've been learning about. And in particular, we do a lot of focus on like deploying machine learning models into real domains and seeing what happens. And one of the things that happens is uh, issues with interpretable features and interpretable data. So that's what we're going to talk about today. So if you start like reading into the data-centric AI literature, which I hope you all spend a little time doing after this class, you might start to notice these references here and there to this concept of interpretable features. Um, like there's a lot of algorithms that claim to generate interpretable features or uh, users who are like, we need human understandable features, uh, interpretable feature selection and extraction. This is like this topic that kind of gets mentioned in the background a lot. Uh, so today we're gonna talk about what that actually means what are interpretable features and why do we care? So quick roadmap. Uh, I'm gonna start off by talking about interpretable machine learning in general, because I'm not sure if everyone in here has even heard of that concept. Uh, then we're gonna talk a bit about why we care about interpretable features, when we care about them. Um, we're gonna talk about what exactly it means for a feature to be interpretable, because uh, that's kind of just like a buzzword, interpretable. And then we'll talk a little bit about what steps we need to do and what we need to be careful about to actually get interpretable features in our machine learning. All right, can I get a quick show of hands? How many people here like know what interpretable machine learning means? A little bit. All right, awesome. I'm glad I have this section then. Um, so we're going to talk a bit. This is a, maybe a phrase at some point you'll run into. It's kind of getting a lot of heat these days. People think it's important. It is important. Um, to give you the quick spiel about what it means for machine learning to be interpretable, as I'm hoping you guys sort of have learned by this point, um, in machine learning, we take data, so features, we input them into a machine learning model. The machine learning model does some math and it gives us an output. Uh, so for example, maybe we have some information about houses or blocks of houses, and then we're gonna get a house price prediction coming out. Um, and the question then is in this black box in the middle, what exactly is happening? Because that could be like a linear regression model where we're just multiplying a number by every feature and we get an output, or that could be like a multi-billion parameter neural network. Um, and depending on what we have, it might be very easy or very hard to understand how this machine learning model is actually getting that prediction of 198,000. So why do we care if we know what's happening on the inside? Like if the model's doing well, why does it matter how it's doing it? Well, there's like three major reasons. So the first comes to debugging and validation. So maybe we've trained our model and we get like a good training performance, we get a great testing performance, um, but does that mean it's actually going to work when we release it into the world? Um, it could be, as I think you've been learning in this class, that the data is not great. There's something wrong with the data, and that can come back to bite you. So, for example, here we have a machine learning model that's trained to predict the risk of death from pneumonia of patients being admitted to the hospital. Um, we have two forms of explanations of that machine learning's logic. Or we have two different like, explanations of features, right? So this first chart here, what way we can interpret this is as the age of patients increase, this model tends to predict that they're more likely to die of pneumonia, um, which is exactly what we know in the medical community, that makes sense. What the second chart is saying is that if a patient has asthma, their risk of dying from pneumonia decreases a little bit, which is the exact opposite of what we think we know from the machine learning, uh, from the medical community. And the issue here is that in the past, when patients come into the hospital with asthma, they immediately get intensely treated for pneumonia because their risk is so high, um, which actually results in a slightly reduced death rate for patients with asthma. But it also means that if we were to deploy this model into the real world, we would suddenly have a lot of people with asthma dying, probably, which is not great. Um, the second area we might need interpretable machine learning, generally, if you release your model out into the wild and it does something and it does something bad, you want to know why it did something bad, like your self-driving car hits a person, you need to know why that happened so you can fix it or people aren't going to want to deal with your machine learning model anymore. And finally, the area that my lab works with a lot, so we'll get some examples from this. I think in, it's safe to say in most domains these days, machine learning models aren't like completely replacing humans. You still have humans that are using the models to some extent. Um, and these humans have a lot of experience, they have a lot of information, um, they're experts at their field. And now we're tossing in a machine learning model that's gonna be like, hey, the answer is 17 and you now need to understand what on earth that 17 means, especially if you disagree with it. Like if your machine learning model is coming in and telling you something that to you makes zero sense, 
you're not going to want to use it if you don't understand where that came from. And so you can judge who's right, you or the model. So generally speaking, we need interpretable machine learning in general. Um, anytime, we call it the uh, problem formulation is incomplete. What that basically means is you don't know enough about the entire world to perfectly and with perfect accuracy actually measure the quality of your machine learning model, um, which is in most cases. Uh, if there's any kind of risk, like um, if you have a self-driving car, clearly there's risk. Actually, in most cases, there's some degree of risk to an incorrect answer. Otherwise, why would you need machine learning at all if you don't care what the answer is? And anytime you have humans involved in decision making. Cool, so that's interpretable machine learning. Are there any questions at this point? We're all cool on, okay, cool. So this is a class on data-centric machine learning, uh, not just machine learning in general. So we're not gonna go into too much detail on interpretable models. Instead, we're going to talk about a super important part of interpretability, which is the interpretable features. Um, interpretability of models starts at the feature level. So to motivate that a bit, let's go back to the example I introduced earlier. So we have a machine learning model. It takes in a bunch of information about blocks of houses in California. This is the California housing data set, um, like the location of the block of houses, how many people live there, median income, so on. We're gonna train some various models. We don't care too much about what's happening in this black box. We're training various models to do, um, to predict the, the median price. I'm gonna go through and I'm gonna show you guys just a few like explanations I've generated on this model uh, of a, or a few explanations I've generated on this data of models trained on different types of features. So here we have what's called a decision tree explanation. People like decision trees. They say they're super interpretable. Um, this is going to explain, I'm gonna take some block of houses, and in this block of houses, X7 is less than 0.12. Um, so I'm gonna head in, what is that, to the right? I'm gonna get, okay, um, X1 is less than negative 177. You know, I'm gonna work my way down the tree. I'm gonna see what the prediction is. So based on this explanation, how many people here would say they understand how this model is making predictions? on house prices. All right, some of you are smarter than I am, that's for sure. We have a few people kind of understanding. Um, personally, I have no idea how this model is making any predictions really on house prices. If I need to explain to someone who doesn't do machine learning, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't know where to begin. Um, the issue here is that X7 is kind of like a meaningless thing. Uh, I don't know what any of these numbers mean. Um, so I'm left knowing nothing. Uh, in reality, what these numbers are is a uh, principal component analysis reduction of the original data set. I'm not gonna go into too much detail about that, but basically we've taken our features and we've collapsed them down into a smaller feature set. And the result is that I don't know what the model's doing. So this might seem a bit contrived to some of you. Um, so let's go back a step. Here's another explanation of a machine learning model on the California housing data set. In this case, I used a automatic feature generation algorithm to compute something like 400 features automatically. I did some feature selection, uh, trained a model, took the most important features, and each bar in this chart represents generally how important that feature is to the model prediction. Um, so this is a bit better. I think we all know like what the word latitude means, so that's a good, good start. Um, it's still a bit hard, yes. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, depending on the algorithm you're using to compute importance, the actual like unit can be different. So in this case, it's a bit of like a unitless importance. Um, it's a measure of how much, if you modify these inputs, how much will the output change? Um, so in this case, it's like relative. So these latitude plus longitude feature, if you change it a bit, will result in a pretty big change in the model prediction. Um, and then the latitude mod one will be a little bit less. Does that answer your question? Um, in some types of explanations, which we're going to see later, those bars actually represent exactly how much of the output we're getting from that input. Um, yeah, so this is getting a bit better. Um, but it's still kind of, I don't know, I find it hard to reason about things like cosine of longitude and tangent of latitude. Also, the same information is popping up in like every feature here. Uh, so if I was a real estate agent trying to use this model and price a house based on this, 
uh, I don't know that I would necessarily love this machine learning model, or I'd want to use it all that much. I might prefer something like this, um, which has significantly easier to understand features. It's not perfect. I don't know, you know, latitude and longitude are still a bit hard to deal with, but at least I, I can understand where everything is here, and it's different pieces of information. I think it's also important to note that this model and this model had basically the exact same performance in this case. I'm going to talk a bit about performance uh, later on. All right, so you might still think this is kind of contrived, that I'm just throwing a bunch of complicated features in. Um, but this is the kind of stuff that we deal with in the real world. So like I said, my lab works on a lot of deployment projects. We try to deploy machine learning in the real world and see what the problem is. Um, so the first thing we learn is that, yes, we do need to explain our models in a lot of cases. And we also learn that interpretability of features is important. So uh, in this one study we ran, we worked with a team of child welfare screeners for the course of about a year. Um, and what these screeners did was they would take an information they'd get about a potential case of child abuse. So someone would report to them, I think there's potentially a case of child abuse here. They would consider all of the factors of the case and then they screen in or screen out, meaning they either investigate the case further or they leave it for the time being. Um, as you can imagine, this is a very high risk decision. So our collaborators came in and they trained a machine learning model that looked at all of this information about the history of the child, the um, past court involvements, past referrals, demographic information, all that. And it would uh, compute a 1 through 20 risk score. So 20 means the data suggests that this child is at very high risk. One suggests there's no risk here. Uh, and as you can imagine, when you're giving somebody a number that's going to determine the fate of a child's life, they like to be confident about that information. And so they wanted an explanation of that number. So we gave him an explanation of that number. Um, and so this here, this is what I was talking about earlier. These are actual contributions. So um, a big red bar here means that that feature is greatly increasing the risk to this child. We'd also have negative blue bars, which suggest that this feature is lowering the risk to the child. In this case, you can see, for example, if a child's an infant, generally their risk score will increase a lot because Infants are much higher, are much more vulnerable, so they tend to be investigated more. And what we found when we, we ran through a series of user studies over the course of the year, we went through a bunch of the stuff that's like state of the art in machine learning explainability um, and interpretable models. And what we learned is that pretty much every issue that the screeners had with this was that the features to them were not meaningful. They were not useful features. So for example, we had a bunch of features that were like, um, number of child days that the child was in a placement in the past, like 365 days, 730 days, 180 days, 90 days. Um, we had a lot of these sort of repeated features that they weren't used to dealing with. Um, we had a lot of this like machine learning-y language. Uh, so lots of like one-hot encoded features. Um, we would say things like role of the child in focus is alleged victim is true, as opposed to just that the role is alleged victim, or like child has sibling is false instead of just child doesn't have sibling. Um, I think importantly, there was a lot of features there that for whatever reason, the machine learning model was using kind of a lot in very specific cases, but that didn't seem important at all to the screeners. Like, um, there was uh, at least a few cases where the parents didn't have their date of birth, like the date of birth was missing, that was considered extremely protective. Like that lowered the risk score a lot. Um, which regardless of why that was actually happening, the child welfare screeners, the moment they saw that, they were like, I'm done with this model, I'm not using this. This makes no sense. Um, so after all of this study, what we did was our team, our collaborators went in, they retrained the model using a significantly smaller set of features, and um, they actually got a model that had basically the same performance and was significantly easier to use. Which brings me to, I think, this important point. Some of you might have already started thinking about this a little bit, which is if you're limiting your features to be important, if you're avoiding all these feature engineering tools that I talked about earlier, is that not going to affect the performance of the model? Um, this chart I have here is a, um, like a, a plot from a DARPA paper that gets mentioned a lot as evidence that there's this thing called the performance interpretability trade-off. Um, but this plot is not based on any real data. All of those points were just drawn for the sake of an illustrative example. And it turns out that in the real world, often when we care about interpretability of both the model and the features, we actually find that we get more efficient training better generalization of models. We get fewer adversarial examples because 
the data we're using, the features we're using, we know are actually important. So your model has less chance to catch on these spurious examples. Um, there will be cases where if you try to factor in interpretability, you're going to get lower performance. That's inevitable. That happens. Um, at that point, there's no good answer here for you. It's not like there's a thing you're supposed to do. It just depends on the, the field. So in like child welfare, if we didn't have an interpretable model, they wouldn't use the model, period. So interpretability is non-negotiable. In other cases, if there's less risk, you might prefer a higher performing model. It just depends on your users. All right, I'm going to go quickly now through. I guess, does anyone have any questions here? Good. No? All good? All right, cool. Uh, so now I'm going to go quickly through what exactly it means for a feature to be interpretable. So I gave some examples earlier. Uh, I don't know, you know how, much, how much that meant to you, but um, there's a few different properties that we need to uh, think about when we think about the interpretability of features. Um, so the somewhat unsatisfying answer to the general question of what are interpretable features is the features that are the most useful and meaningful to your user. And as I'm going to talk about later, there's really no way out of it. If you want your model to be used by someone, you need to talk to the person who's going to be using it um, to identify what they want to use. So I'm just going to go through an example of a few different features here that have different levels of interpretability and talk a bit about different properties that we can consider when thinking about the interpretability of features. Um, so we're going back again to that housing example, hopefully you all remember. So inputs about information about uh, blocks of houses, output is average house price or median house price. Um, these are five features that you could use. So the first property of interpretability of a feature is its readability. This is where a lot of people end when thinking about interpretability of features. Readable means do I understand what this feature is even talking about at all? So in the decision tree example I had earlier, you, you didn't know what x of 7 was. That was not a readable feature. x12 in this case, that's not a readable feature. This is usually a very easy problem to solve. If you're going to be explaining your model, make sure you have like some sort of code, some sort of description of your features. Taking a step further, we have understandability. So that's, all right, I know what the feature is referring to, but can I actually use this feature in any meaningful way? Can I logic about it? Um, so something like a normalized measure of median income, so like 0.8 out of 1, is potentially less useful than the actual median income number, like 90,000 or whatever. Then, depending on your domain, this might be more or less important, but relevance of features can be extremely useful if you want users to actually use your model and trust it. If you believe that your model is good and you need your users to trust it, you want to make sure that they look at the explanation and go, yes, this looks reasonable. So if you have a lot of features in there, like the um, missing date of birth example I gave earlier, um, that's not relevant and it's going to turn off your users. Something like common house color. Um, I'm not like an expert on house pricing. Maybe common house color is actually really important. But to me, I don't, I don't feel like that should be that important. And a model that's using it heavily is going to lose my trust. And then finally, I'm not going to talk too much about this because it's sort of an issue all on its own. But sometimes, especially if your users aren't like machine learning experts, it can be helpful to collapse your information down into like very digestible concepts, like take your information about the neighborhood into something abstract. The danger of that, of course, is depending on how you do this, you could completely mislead your user, but um, something to consider. All right, any questions here? Yes. Can you go back? Yeah. As someone who's not an expert in this topic, the average house size seems more interpretable to you than area quality. So can you talk more about this after? Yeah, absolutely. So I think that's, first of all, it's a very good point that depending on your users, and also this might not be a great example of abstract, of abstract features. Um, I think a good example of this is with like college rankings, where depending on who you are, uh, you might prefer to get all of the information about the college, but a lot of times college rankings are shared as like just general like education quality, sports quality. Um, and that's the kind of thing that attracts a lot of people because it's just faster and easier to parse. Um, I think college is also college rankings is also a great example of how you can completely change your rankings depending on how you do those categories. Um, so it's something to be careful about. But it if you have complex concepts, being able to collapse them down to something abstract can be beneficial. Answer your question? Um, cool. All right. 
So now, perhaps the most practical part of the talk. We've talked about why we need interpretable features and what they are. Um, so how do we get them? Uh, I really like this quote from a data scientist, I think from a consulting firm, in this study on machine learning explanations and deployment, who said that feature engineering is the first step to making an interpretable model, even if we don't have a model yet. So if you think that you need your model to be interpretable, uh, you need to think about that interpretability at the feature engineering stage. stage. So let's talk about a few methods that exist that sort of help with feature interpretability. Uh, the first sort of inevitable one is to include the users. And there's a few ways to do this. And by user here, I mean whoever's going to be looking at your explanations of the machine learning model. So like in our child welfare example, this was child welfare screeners. Um, I'm going to go through this sort of briefly. This is a major concept in the human-computer interaction um, domain, the iterative design process. Um, this is sort of a formal way of incorporating users anytime you're designing anything that involves them. Um, this is like a big topic, so you're going to get like a very quick intro to it. But basically the idea is that you're including the end users of your product in every step of the process. So after you've planned what you're going to do, you talk about the requirements of the users. So you're already from the beginning, you're interviewing your users, you're figuring out what features they find important. Um, when you test your features, or test your product in general, you're testing your explanation, you're doing that through user studies, not just performance testing. Um, you evaluate on your users and so on. So obviously this takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of time from your users, so it might not always be possible. But there are things we can do to sort of reduce the amount of time that this takes. So one example is the field of collaborative feature engineering. Um, so these are a series of systems that exist that make it easier for people especially non-machine learning experts, to come in and help with your feature engineering. So if you have somebody who um, is like, if you have like a person, especially a person who's not a machine learning expert, who's finding the things that are most important, you're more, it's more likely that those people are going to understand the features if they're the kind of people who have generated themselves. So I'll go through a few examples of systems for collaborative feature engineering that exist. The first is Flock. Um, so this is a system that uses this concept of comparisons to generate, to help people generate features um, easier. Uh, so Flock uses a system I'm about to go over to combine machine engineered features with crowd generated features. Um, and if you just ask a person to like look at something and say why, why you think that is something to generate features, they often don't generate useful information. So this system's gonna help with that. So to go through this crowd generating features concept, uh, I'll go through an example from the paper that they use to evaluate. Um, so the first, or one, one example of, that they use in the paper was distinguishing between a painting by Monet versus a painting by other people who have similar paintings to Monet. Um, so the, the uh, system starts with asking users to, or teaching users a little bit about the domain um, in this case, we can show them a series of Monet paintings um, so that they can get a sense of the problem. Ideally, if you have domain expert users, they already know this. And this is important. We're showing them, um, we're asking them to do a comparison, not just a description. So we show them two paintings, one by Monet, one by not Monet. Um, and we ask them, all right, which one's the Monet? And tell us why. And then we ask them to just write a natural human sentence to describe it. So no code required, no machine learning expertise. All they're doing is, is writing sentences, which most people can do. So for example, the first painting is a Monet because there's lilies in it. It looks like Monet's style. Um, the second one isn't Monet because he doesn't put people in his paintings. Then we split the description by conjunctions. So punctuation and and, and ors. We cluster those um, phrases based on similar concepts. And then we show these clusters back to our crowd again, and we ask them to provide a description, like a feature label in the form of a question. So something like, does the painting have flowers or lilies? Might describe this feature. And that's our feature. So we now know any, any painting that was described using these phrases has flowers and lilies, and that's our final, question, our final um, feature. And here, clearly, this is a feature that people are actually using because this is something that they described as helping them 
switch, uh, choose between those two um, classes. Uh, and so the results of this um, using this combination of machine engineered features and the crowdsourced features uh, resulted in better performance than just using machine engineered features. It resulted in better performance than using the data directly and also better than having the people just classify themselves. And like I said, it generates features that should be interpretable because it actually is the kind of information people are using to make these, these distingu two distinguishing classes. Um, another example of collaborative feature engineering is ballet. This was made by a student in uh, the Data to AI lab as well. Um, I'm not going to go into details about this either because this is kind of a very big uh, and important system, but basically it's abstracting away everything that's not related to feature engineering to allow somebody to focus just on the features. So the way ballet works is a person can come in, they write a single function to uh, generate a single data set off of the data set, or offer to generate a single feature from the data set. For example, um, this is just all the Python code you need to convert uh, age into a higher or lower than 30. Um, and then this automatically gets incorporated with everyone else's features that they all write. Um, it goes through, it uses uh, auto ML tactics and evaluation to get immediate feedback on the quality of that feature. Um, and then it, it automatically does feature selection to select the ones that are most important. So this does require people to know how to write Python code, but it only requires Python code um, rather than having to understand machine learning as a whole. The second uh, method for having interpretable features in your explanation is to use interpretable feature transforms and explanation transforms. Um, this is my research. Uh, so my team has developed this library, Pyreal, that handles the transformations of features automatically to give you interpretable explanations. Um, I'm gonna go through and give you an example of what that looks like. Uh, again, can't go into too much detail about this, but just to give you the overview, in the explanation generation system in general, we start off with features in some sort of feature space. So we have some sort of data, basically. Data comes to us. We have to run some sort of transformations on that data to get it ready for machine learning. So for example, we have to one-hot encode features um, for a machine learning model to use them, or we might have to standardize. We also need to have some sort of transformations to get ready for the explanation algorithm. Um, but I think the important thing to focus on here is that we need to transform data for the model. And finally, there's some sort of transformations we'll want to make the explanation more useful to users. Um, so this is, this is sort of the space of the features that are interpretable that I've been talking about this whole time. So if this is confusing, because I'm kind of going through this fast, hopefully this example will clarify a little bit. Um, on the top here, we have one of the explanations I showed earlier that I label as being pretty good, but we can do better. Uh, for example, instead of displaying median income as some standardized 0.123 unitless value, we're displaying it as the original input to the model, like $34,000. Um, instead of displaying things like longitude and latitude, which again aren't as interpretable, we could show it as the city itself if we don't really care about the exact details of longitude and latitude. Um, we can show one hot encoded features as the language that we understand. And Pyrel handles all the transformations of the explanation under the hood to get this more useful explanation. Um, and this is something you're going to be playing around a little bit with the lab, so hopefully if it doesn't make a lot of sense yet, it will then. Are there any questions? I know I went through a lot of technical details there. Yes? that you then transform the features again to make them interpretable for the end user, or are you making them interpretable from the beginning before you train the model? Yeah, so the question there is, are we going to, like, converting to the, transforming to the model and then back to interpretable, or are we going directly to interpretable, right? Uh, so it's sort of, in a way, both. Um, so for the, generally speaking, explanation algorithms, we'll make an explanation on your features in the model-ready state. So you'll get an explanation of how the model used the features it was given. Um, so from there, for a lot of explanations, you can actually convert, transform the explanation itself into something more interpretable, while the feature values can go directly to interpretable, if that makes sense. 
Uh, and depending on the context, that may or may not be possible. So we do it when it's possible. Um, so like in this case, these are additive Shep values. Because they're additive, you can add them together to get the, the importance of two features together. Um, if that weren't the case, you might not be able to do that. Does that answer your question? Cool. Um, so finally, we're going to talk a little bit about interpretable feature generation. So this is the idea of automatic feature generation algorithms. There's a lot of them that exist. Um, I showed you guys an example earlier of one that just automatically runs through a bunch of different kinds of transformations. But the features we generated, as I said, might not be interpretable if you don't think about it. There are some algorithms being made that keep interpretability in mind, so they promise to generate features that are a little bit more interpretable to start with. Uh, I'm just going to go through one of them kind of quickly, the mind the gap model. So this is an algorithm that you can use if you have binary features. So a binary feature might be something like, let's say we're trying to classify animals, a binary feature might be lays eggs. So either true, the animal does lay eggs, or false. Um, has a backbone or doesn't have a backbone. That's another binary feature. Um, so the way that this algorithm works is it starts by randomly assigning features to groups using and or or. So these are three different examples of feature groups. Uh, either the animal lays eggs or doesn't. The animal may have a backbone and a tail or not. Uh, and it might be toothed or be a predator or not. From here, it looks to maximize the separation between groups based on these features. So it, if you can imagine these plots as being like uh, dimensionality reductions of every row in the data set down to two axes. Um, and you can imagine, let's say yellow is lays eggs and blue is doesn't lay eggs in this first chart. And you can see that that has a pretty big separation between the yellow and blue group. Maybe the second one is backbone and tail. And in that case, we have a much smaller separation. So it's iterating over this finding of groups to maximize the separation until it finds the set of these feature groups that maximize that separation. Uh, so here you might see something like lays eggs, backbone or tail or toothed, and then predator as three different feature groups it finds that maximize separation. And then when you start to look at the rows that they set, you might notice that in one cluster, lays eggs is always zero, um, the second feature is always one, and the third one is sometimes uh, one sometimes zero, you know, I'd have 50% chance, and that group we can then come in and classify as mammal. All right, so if there's one thing, well, actually, I guess before I go to this, any questions at this point? Good. Cool. Uh, so if there's one thing I hope you guys take away from today, it's that machine learning models are only as interpretable as their features. If you care about deploying your model, you should care about interpretability. If you care about interpretability, you should care about the interpretability of your features. Um, interpretable features are just whatever's meaningful to the user, which depends, unfortunately, heavily from between domains. Um, and generally, you generate inter uh, interpretable features by including the users, um, using interpretable transforms, and using feature generation algorithms that include interpretability. All right, I'm going to give a quick spiel for the lab. Hopefully, you guys have a chance to look at the lab. Uh, if you remember, in one of the first slides, I talked about how validation is a really important motivator for interpretability. It helps us find, for example, flaws in our data. Uh, so what we're going to do, or what you're going to do in the lab, is generate a bunch of explanations on different kinds of feature spaces, and you're going to try to find the flaw in a sample data set. Uh, you're going to be generating, probably, these what's called a bee swarm plot. So I want to talk just a little bit about what this means, because this is a lot of information. This is kind of a really good way to visualize your data, I think, um, in a machine learning explanation. And the way you interpret this, the color of each dot uh, and this is explained in the lab as well, but just to give you guys an introduction, the color of each dot represents the feature value itself. And then the, its position along the x-axis represents the actual amount that it contributes to this feature's prediction. In this case, the SHAP value is actually in the same unit as the model output. So for example, if you look up there in the upper right-hand corner, you see these uh, red dots. That basically means that in blocks of houses, with very high median income, the average house price tends to be significantly higher because of that. Um, about 150,000 higher for that specific point with a very high median income. That sort of thing makes sense. Any questions about this? Or anything else? All right. Well, that's the whole presentation. So if there's any questions or points of discussion, yeah. Interpretable means 
interpretable by humans. Yes. Is there a concept of interpretable by other algorithms or machines? By other all right, so the question was interpretable means interpretable by humans. Is there a concept of interpretable by other machines? It's interesting. Do you have an example of what something like that might look like? I'm curious. So, well, well, well. Yeah, so I personally don't, I mean, I generally work with interpretable for humans. Do you mean something like could another AI yeah, yeah. understand the first AI? <laughs> Now you are talking about contact collaboration of uh, models with humans. Uh, I wonder if there is potential collaboration of different systems. Mm -hmm. I think it's a really interesting concept. It's not one I've really looked into. I don't know if anyone else has. I think all of this would still apply. Your user can be another robot and it's still going to have its requirements. I imagine a robot will be much better at understanding more complex machine-y features than a human would, but no reason it wouldn't, it wouldn't apply. Any other questions? Cool. Thank you all very much. <laughs>